Now, um, I have read your book as an expanding map of ideas, interconnected despite uh, distances and spreading like uh, viruses and building yearnings for new horizons. What prompted you to travel beyond the known? Yeah, this is an idea that was forming in my mind, I think, my whole life. And I was thinking about the things that make humans us, right, different from other animals. And one of the things is speech, and uh, obviously we have like much larger brains, but one of the main things is technology. And I thought about where does this technology come from and how does technology come about? Because when I was younger, uh, people would ask me what I wanted to do, and I would always just say, well, I was really interested in Star Trek, so I don't I always just say, I want to invent warp drives so we can travel to other stars, right? And I wasn't actually all that interested in the progression of technology and how it came about, but it slowly occurred to me over the years and reflecting on it that the way we develop technology is by challenging ourselves. So by constantly trying to do that next thing, we develop the technologies that enable us to do more and more and more. And this is how technology has always come about in human history. It's, we challenge ourselves. We set a goal first. We always set the goal first. And then in figuring out how to achieve that goal, we develop all this technology and we can apply that technology to all kinds of different things. And so I think this is really the story of how technology evolves. And exploration is one of those huge driving forces in human history that really has given us a lot of this technology. What was the most important thing you learned about the world while writing this book? How, well, the, the most interesting thing I think was how interconnected the world was really. Indeed. And we humans have always been explorers. Ever since you know we started out, we were chasing the migrating herds of animals. And we were trying to figure out, you know, what is over the horizon? What's across that lake? What, you know, what is on the other side of that? Because maybe there's new resources, new sources of food, new tools we can use, new materials. And humans just have always been curious. And this has been one of the real assets we've had that uh, has enabled us to survive. And so just this sense of how uh, we've always been driven by this goal to find out something new and how interconnected this means we were. I mean, some of the th one of the things that I found super fascinating was I wanted to find out, you know, what it would feel like to be someone who lived 2,000 years ago or something like that, like a, a Roman, for example. What would a Roman think about the world? What would they know about China? What would they know about Africa? What would they know about how the world looked and how it was connected? And it turns out that uh, probably a lot more than we would normally think. And people had pooled their knowledge a long time ago. One of the first maps of the world was created in Alexandria uh, by Eratosthenes, who was fascinating and developed all these things, including our dating system. And, you know, someone 2,000 years ago really had a pretty good sense, at least in, in Europe, say, that they, they would have a pretty good sense of what the world would look like, at least the old world without uh, the Americas. And, and that's really fascinating, I think. Yes, I totally loved including the way in which you dismantle all kinds of cliches. I mean, we have this tendency to consider, I don't know, worlds uh, thousands or hundreds even of years ago. So, I don't know, antiquated and it was not. They were much, much closer to our ways of thinking than we, we imagine. Absolutely. If you walk through the streets of Pompeii, which is really cool in, in, uh, in Italy, if you go to the old Roman city of Pompeii, you kind of come to this realization that they were pretty much similar to us, right? Like the people, <laughs> they like the theater and they like the bars and they have all the, and they have dogs, they have all the kind, you know, they were not really that different from us, really. Just yeah. the, the main difference is just their technology. Now we speak a lot about mythology and spaceships and Marco Polo and Elon Musk and um, Columbus's Santa Maria and Voyager 1, for instance. Now humanity mm -hmm. didn't change that much as, as we've discovered. Um, especially in terms of longing for adventure and discovery. What did change, however? Well, the main thing that changed is, is the tools that we developed along the way. So, it, I mean, this is one of the main points is, you know, we often embarked on these expeditions when they were right at the cutting edge of our technology, right? And the, the point is that uh, you can't really wait for the technology to come about before you do something. You have to set a goal and then develop the technology to, to do it. And this is why, you know, it's really important to have visionaries like Elon Musk, for example, who 
uh, sets a goal of going to Mars, and then they develop the spaceships to do it. And, and it's just through that trial and error process. It's really the evolution of technology. You can almost say that technology really is exactly like a biological evolutionary process. You try something, and if it works, people do it. And they do it more and more. So it's this idea. It's almost like a mutation. And if it works, then it's accepted and, and propagates. And, and so people copy the, the other uh, ideas and technologies. And if it doesn't work, then they don't do it anymore. And then it, it doesn't survive. And so it, it's pretty much the development of technologies, this trial and error process brought about by these challenges. And one of those main challenges throughout human history has been exploration. Yeah, it is um, a history of technology as well as um, a history of many other things of exploration, as you said, of adventure and so on. And I love the fact that you speak about how um, the world and human knowledge are actually accelerating if we are to view them in the larger context, in the larger frame of the history of the planet, let's say. Now, what, what do you think this acceleration will bring about for future explorers? Well, it's, you know, it's almost hard to predict. So I, I generally almost don't like making too many predictions about the future, but I found myself in the position where I was trying to do that, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, as you say, there is kind of this acceleration of technology, at least in certain areas. One of the things that did strike me is, you know, we've had massive changes in technology and computing, right? And in miniaturization of computers, we're talking on now electronic devices that 30, 40, 50 years ago would have been almost unimaginable, but like Star Trek. Short much. period of time. Or yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Even shorter. Yeah. Um, but, but certain areas, you know, we went to the moon 50 years ago and haven't gone back since, you know, so certain areas we haven't really had that much progression. And I think it's because we're not challenging ourselves enough in those areas. Right. And so it's, so it's all a matter of, of, of where you challenge yourself. Um, so what will change? So I think human lifespan will expand in the future. Uh, we're making a lot of strides in figuring out human aging, uh, obviously technology. The question is, you know, what is the ultimate purpose or goal or, or outcome really? Well, you know, will we kind of merge with our technology and all have computer chips in our brains or become computers or upload our consciousness into a computer? And I don't know, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, and maybe that's true, but I think ultimately, if you just look at even the technologies we know are possible, humans will be able to leave our planet and travel to other planets and eventually other solar systems. And I think that's virtually inevitable because someone will want to do that uh, along the way. And it's pretty much the same Thing of, of the inevitability of human expansion when you look at our drive for exploration throughout the past in the future there will be this inevitability of expansion into space if we survive long enough to carry that out so we'll reach the stars eventually not only in poetry now you mentioned challenge what was the most challenging aspect of writing this book on a personal level well, so the book, in some sense, is almost a view into my inner thought process and monologue. I really think a lot about history and really think a lot about these kind of ideas. And for me, it's almost writing what was in my heart. It was actually really easy to, to get the kind of ideas out there. But the, I think the writing process is always you just have to challenge yourself to do it, you to force yourself, basically, to, to sit down and write. So I think that was... Um, you know, to, to, to get it all out and then you can kind of work on it. Uh, but I have to say that I'm not sure I enjoy writing so much, but I definitely enjoy having written something or, or the, and I enjoy the creative thought process behind it for sure. Now, as a reader, apart from my interviewer identity right now, I must say I totally enjoyed it. It has rhythm, it is fascinating, it has humor, it's very readable. I, I, I used to uh, read fragments aloud to my entire family and they were all pretty jealous of me because I got the copy first. So <laughs> now oh, it's you. going to read it. Yeah. Uh, now, in which of your identities do you feel most comfortable? Historian of exploration, space engineer, traveler, what would it be? I, I, I have to say, I actually kind of like to do a little bit of everything, so I don't like to put so much labels because I, I really am just a curious explorer of technology and humanity and everything. So, I mean, I just really like to learn as much as I can. And I think in some sense, for me, I think that is the, the meaning of life. I mean, people are always kind of trying to ascribe meaning 
to it or purpose to life. And for me, I think it's just about curiosity and learning things. And that really makes life enjoyable is uh, learning is one of the most enjoyable things we can do. And I think even for everyone, that's true at a certain age, at least, right? When you're a young uh, a child exploring the world, you're trying to take in as much information and you are delighted by learning something new. And um, I just wish we could all keep that throughout our lives because that's something that I, th I think we should treasure. It's really, and I think it really brings a lot of joy and uh, yeah. Now we have all have been more or less confined during the last year. How will mm -hmm. this isolation affect our innate desire um, to travel in the years to come? What do you think? Are we going to grow more reluctant or on the contrary, are we going to, to crave for more and more discoveries to make up for the lost time? Well, I think you can still participate in some way. I think people have kind of shifted their behavior a little bit, but uh, maybe they've gone more to reading or to online discussion. I, it's funny because during the pandemic, I've actually been, I think, more social, but just kind of in an online sense of yeah. reconnected with old friends through our technologies. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely actually one of the things that I'm most looking forward to that I've missed the most is traveling because I really enjoy traveling a lot. Um, and something that strikes me is, you know, we have the technology to kind of virtually travel almost anywhere. You could take a visit to Rome or some other city uh, kind of from your couch on the weekend through your technology, but people don't really do that. And why don't they do that? It's very strange, right? And I think it's because there's something really important about being there, right? And being there yourself. And so I think people will continue to do that. They will continue to travel and explore um, in person, even though we have the technologies to kind of virtually participate. And that's very important and is good, but I think it's a supplement to actually doing things yourself. You are also an MIT credentialed scientist, a podcast host. Now, how do you balance all of these personas so as to, to keep your spirit of adventure and, and exploration both far from the mudding world and yet always um, pushing its boundaries? Well, I think the common theme is curiosity and learning new things. And so I've, I always want to keep learning and that's something that really motivates me. So uh, yeah, I think that's the driving force that connects everything I do. I'm glad you speak about curiosity and learning because um, my next question would have been, how do you explain to a child our 10,000 years of history of exploration? Ah, <laughs> well, I think it's an innate human drive to learn more about our surroundings. And it comes, I think, really from our evolutionary history. So humans, most animals are very specialized in a particular type of food source or a particular type of behavior. Humans are generalists. Humans are generalists in our food. We can eat pretty much anything, right? We can eat any, pretty much any type of plant or animal. Um, and we don't have sharp teeth or claws or any kind of natural defenses. So we're kind of just naked apes, right? And we have to defend ourselves and we have to uh, find our own food. And so that means we have a large brain and the ability to uh, produce tools. And that is basically technology. So it's um, just kind of a matter of our evolution that we've developed this curiosity. And people say that we're uh, specialists in being generalists, so humans, yeah. Do you have a personal hero in terms of traveling? In terms of traveling, um, well, one of the ones that I thought was most interesting that I didn't know about at all was Pythias, Pythias the Greek. And he's from more than 2,000 years ago, and he basically just set out on foot to walk across Europe and map it out and uh, learn as much as possible and visit. And a lot of the things we know about actually come from his writings originally, about tides and the phases of the moon and the scientific method, really and uh, our words for the Arctic and our descriptions of the Arctic and the um, uh, glaciers and icebergs and ice sheets and all those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's someone who I think we should model ourselves after setting out into the world to find out what's there in a peaceful way and interact with people. In a peaceful way, indeed. <laughs> um, what, what is, um, where has your book taken you in terms of your personal voyage? Um, it's introduced me to a lot of people. I get, 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it has let me meet a lot of new people who um, I, I can interact with and uh, open some opportunities. So um, it's, it's a really good way to kind of, you put something out there into the world and people contact you just like this today. And uh, so that um, is, is a really interesting experience. And my last question, why do you think we constantly need to prove to ourselves that we are not alone in the universe? Ah, well, this is, I think, the most interesting question we could possibly ask is, are there other beings like us out in the universe? And it's, it's, a, it's a question of connection. And I think for humans, connection is one of the most important things for psychological well-being, connection with your family, connection with your community, connection with the world, and, and then as, as a whole, as a planet, potentially connection with um, people, others out there like us, and have they shared our experiences? And it's just kind of like watching a movie or something. You connect with the characters and you uh, learn things about yourself by looking at others and you um, take a sense of um, comfort from watching others and, and from experiencing the uh, experiences of others. Now, that has been a great interview. Thank you so much. It was really great meeting you. And I'm so looking forward to, to meeting you again tomorrow, to talking to you. We won't keep you long. So I think you have the Zoom link already. I think it was in the yeah. same mail. Yeah. So perfect. So, perfect. Thank you so, so much. It was great. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.